So, so usually I start with what we're about to do, and then how we did it, and then show you what we got. Um, but to jump right to the chase and the, um, and knock you off off your seat, I'm going to show you what we got and what it looks like, and then I'll show you how we did it. So to kind of inspire you and and wow you, I, I hope. So we made a computer model of. Uh, synaptic transmission in hippocampal uh, area CA1 uh, pyramidal neurons uh, from a 3D reconstruction um, in collaboration with Kristen Harris and um, Mary Kennedy um, and my colleague and, and Terry Sanowski and my colleagues at the Salk Institute. And um, we've used this to study um, uh, vesicular release in the presynaptic terminal and calcium dynamics and, oh, and calcium dynamics in the presynaptic terminal, but also um, the um, effect on AMPA and NMDA receptors and voltage-gated calcium channels and the calcium dynamics in the postsynaptic spine, kind of integrating, unifying um, pre and post together in one realistic model. And, and we've made some interesting discoveries and, and um, uh, published a couple papers on it. I have a couple more in the pipeline. Um, on, on all this that we hope will be coming out soon. So let me just show you um, uh, uh, what it is, and then I'll give you a tour of what's going on behind the scenes. So um, we're going to uh, here we're looking at that 3D reconstruction um, that you'll see in more detail in a minute. It's oh, uh, sorry. I guess this goes upside down. It, it, it's uh, six by six by five microns in size. It would fit inside a single red blood cell, as I pointed out before. Inside this are 450 pieces of axon uh, that make 450 synapses onto dendritic spines of den dendrites of neurons. This is from stratum radiatum of an adult rat uh, hippocampus. And in this picture, um, we're showing one of the dendrites in, in yellow. Um, its postsynaptic density, uh, synaptic contact areas are shown in red. Let's see, do we have a, do I, uh, the pointer? So I don't have to walk out in front of that. Oh, I guess it's the yellow button. Okay. So we have these um, uh, uh, red patches, which are the, um, the postsynaptic density uh, synaptic contact areas on, on the dendritic spines. The green here is a, is a single axon uh, coursing through, making a, a synapse with this particular dendrite right here. And the blue is um, astrocytic uh, glial processes of a single, of a small piece of a single astrocyte. So all, all the blue here you see is all associated with this, uh, all the cell membranes of part of a single astrocyte um, winding its way through, wrapping around everything. Um, this uh, purple uh, object here is a mitochondrion in, 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 the boot, in, in this um, synaptic bouton of, of the axon. And the gray uh, tubing going through the middle of that is the endoplasmic reticulum of that axon. Um, we're going, I'm, I'm going to put this in, into motion, and we're going to be stimulating this axon with a single action potential, which is going to cause um, um, everything that you're about to see happen. Um, we're going to track what happens over 100 milliseconds of time, and time is going to uh, speed up on a logarithmic time scale, because the dynamic range of times is so vast in, in this. Um, and we're going to start from this point of view here and slowly move in. This was all done in Cell Blender and Blender, um, everything it, that you see here. And um, it's not a cartoon. This is the data-driven visualization of the results of the M-cell simulation um, all behind this. And then I'll show you how, how we did it in a minute. So as we... As we put it into motion, if you look closely, you can see little particles moving around in there. Those are the free calcium ions. That's what 100 nanomolar free calcium looks like. Um, 
Um, there's a, maybe half a dozen to a dozen free calcium ions at any one time in the bouton. As we get closer, you can see the synaptic vesicles lined up here. We can see little particles on the membrane. Those are amper and N ray receptors. There's a little cluster of voltage-gated calcium channels right there. The axon's going to turn a bright green color as the, action, as the action potential arrives. And when that happens, the voltage-gated calcium channels start to open. Calcium starts to flow in. The calcium binds to little black particles, which are the calbindin buffering particles. But some of them get, are diffuse over into the axozone where they start to bind to the snare complex. And when they've bound enough calcium, there will be release of, of about 2,000 molecules of glutamate gets released into the extracellular space where it diffuses through the synaptic cleft and extracellular space, activating AMPA and NRA receptors here. But as it diffuses out, it activates glutamate transporters on, located on the astrocyte um, that um, reuptake the glutamate. Um, on the postsynaptic side, um, um, when an NMDA receptor flickers open, it turns white and lets in a little burst of calcium. Um, even uh, before a backpropagating active potential arrives, the, the NMDA receptors are partially blocked by magnesium, but, is, uh, but there's enough chance of it opening that a little bit of calcium comes in. But there'll be a backpropagating active potential that is generated by the soma that propagates up to the dendritic tree, and when it arrives, it opens. It unblocks the NMDA receptor and opens a voltage-gated calcium channel over here, and that lets in a lot of more calcium that binds to calmodulin. There was another release of neurotransmitter that you may, may have just seen happen. I'll explain that in a second. The, the calcium binds to, to the little purple spheres in here, which are the calmodulin, and when they get activated enough, they can bind to the, the, these big blue cubes, which are uh, chemkinase 2, which activates those. Um, um, they can turn from a low activated state in blue to a highly activated state in, in, in turquoise. And as time uh, progresses, the system starts to come back down to a more normal state. The uh, NMDA receptors decay away, the back propagating action potential is over with, and the system starts to return to a more normal state. Um, I'll pause it right there. Um, um, the calcium has been getting pumped out by the by PMCA and NCX exchangers on the membrane, which are these little these little um, gray colored um, transporters that pump calcium from the cytoplasm out. And we, we're not keeping track of the calcium after it gets pumped out, so we're not looking at that. And then the endoplasmic reticulum has circa pumps on it, which are the little green particles that sequester calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum, and we have accurate um, uh, kinetic models of, of all these different molecular species present here that I'll tell you about in a moment. So that's what happens when, during a single action potential on one synapse, and this animation, um, also um, goes over 100 milliseconds of time on a log scale, but we have one more decade of time starting at the, at, at the beginning. And, and in this uh, visualization, uh, we're going to start off in, in the lower right corner of, of that big volume that, you were, that we were just looking at a minute ago. And, and we're going to make everything invisible here except for the synaptic contact areas which are these translucent blobs. So each one of these translucent blobs is, is, the, um, is the pre- and postsynaptic contact area of a single synapse. And I told you in the whole volume there's about 450 synapses. And we're going to stimulate the axons uh, coursing through the volume with a pattern of activity that occurs during sleep. It's called sharp wave activity. It's about 10 hertz. Um, Poisson kind of activity that is occurring on those axons. The release probability of the synapses is only about 20%. Okay, so if we have 450 synapses and we're activating them at 10 hertz, there'd be um, um, there 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 would be uh, 4,500. Um, um, 
if, if, they, if they went at, at a probability one, there'd be about 4,500 um, um, releases per second. We're, we're simulating 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, so that's going to be 450 releases. But a release probability of 20% means there's only going to be about 90 releases um, that occur during the simulation you're about to see within, within the volume. And uh, because it's on a log scale, um, um, about 80 of those releases will be occurring during the last decade of time. And only about 10 releases will be occurring in, in the, all the rest of the time that you're about to see. So things are going to start to, they're going to start slow and then start to heat up as we go along. And we're going to start looking down in this one corner after a, uh, at, at a point in time right when a single release has just occurred. Um, we're going to visualize the glutamate molecules as little um, yellow, uh, I'm sorry, as little white spheres. And when they bind to the glutamate transporter, it's, the transporter is going to turn from yellow, which is the reversible state of the transporter, to red, which is the irreversible state of the transporter right before it it translocates the glutamate across the membrane. And so by having everything invisible, except for the, the glutamate and the glutamate transporters and where the synapses are, you're going to be able to visualize how far the glutamate makes it um, after it's released and, and how much um, overlap and spillover there is between adjacent release sites as, um, as, as it proceeds. So it's kind of a, 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 fun, a fun thing to watch. And, there's, and we have sound. So at this time scale, um, you can track individual glutamate molecules as they diffuse and, and as they bind to transporters. And you can kind of see the occlusion of, of the diffusion space by the invisible, by the, uh, invisible objects, the dendrites and axons around. So now we had another release that occurred. But because time is speeding up, it looks more like an explosion than, than, a, than, a, than a slow spread. And now we've pulled back to a vantage point where we can see most of the volume and, and the releases. And you can see how the transporter goes from yellow to red as it's transporting the glutamate and get an idea of the of the space involved in single releases of neurotransmitter. So it's, it's fun to watch, but it's also um, very, very informative. Uh, and you can learn a lot just, just by watching and, and looking at it. But also, there's a lot of analysis that you can do on the overlap and uh, degree of crosstalk and spillover between, between the synapses. Yeah. Um, so um, you, you can do it a number of different ways. You can do it either of those ways. Um, the way we did it was um, we um, um, told, uh, well, first, first you experiment with these things and you learn what works. And, yeah, and see if it's OK. And then um, you could either output at, at every microsecond everything that's happening and get, um, say, you know, whatever, uh, see, that's 100 milliseconds. So um, that, that would be like 100,000 um, frames at a microsecond per, per frame. Um, and then you could then sample those logarithmically. Or if you knew, know ahead of time that you want to do logarithmic, you can tell M-cell just to output uh, every, 
every, every so often and get a logarithmic sampling of the output that way. Or um, you can uh, tell Blender to, um, to um, read all the data and, and, and skip it logarithmically. So there's a. Yeah. Yeah, during the simulation, uh, it's always a microsecond per time step for this particular case. Yeah. Well, so the the geometry comes from the electron microscope images. Only electron microscope. Yeah, and then and then the and then the placement of the molecules and everything comes from um, what's deduced from labeling studies in different in a different in different samples of tissue than this exact sample of tissue. So from other s tissue samples, it's known that at the synaptic contact areas, there's an approximate density of AMPA and NMDA receptors. We don't know what it really is in this exact one, because when you label it, um, then it obscures um, some of the other things you need to see, right? Um, and so you build up a picture um, uh, of a specific thing from sampling of other of other things, right? Go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm sure you watched this fascinating movie a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> so and we could show it again. It's <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube, I think, right? What's that? Is it on YouTube? Uh, this one's not on. Uh, yeah, we're going to put these on YouTube. We haven't we haven't done it yet. So yeah. So what uh, what is the radius? How far the It's probably one to two microns. So this is, you know, six microns across. Some of the, some of them seem to be about two microns even, so at the at the very fringe, of it, right? So, so based on these simulations, so how much of this stuff is actually happening? So, so we we've um, defined kind of two terms mm -hmm. to talk about this. So one is spillover, okay. and the other is crosstalk. So spillover is, you know, does the glutamate get to a distant location? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's lots and lots of spillover. But crosstalk is, does it do anything physiological once it gets there? So if, if your measure of physiological is, does it open any AMPA or NMDA receptors at those remote locations? The answer is n very rarely. It's, um, but it is bound. To, oh, and, the reason, and the reason why is really interesting, right? So it takes two or more glutamate molecules bound to an AMPA or an MDA receptor to make it open. It, they won't open when a single glutamate binds. So the odds uh, of, of, a, of a remote receptor <laughs> being, you know, uh, you know, being bound by two or more glutamates that come from a remote site is really low because the concentration is so of the glutamate is so low once it gets there. Here in the visualization, you can see, um, you know, individual spots. Right, it's easier to see on the screen here. And if you zoom in, right, you can see individual spots where a receptor has been bound. Right, if that were, I mean, these are glutamate transporters. But if that were an, an AMPA receptor, we could, we could, we could color it and visualize and say that one is singly bound. Uh, but if you ask what the, what the concentration of glutamate was in that area, the number of glutamate particles is so low that the concept of concentration becomes a little bit you know, nebulous. Right? Um, but you, know, the, the, you can ask what's the probability that within the, within the binding time of the AMPA receptor that a second one would come along and bind there and then make it doubly bound, it's extremely low that that would happen. So, um, uh, the, so crosstalk that results in activation of a remote receptor is really low, but it's singly bound, right? So if there were a release of transmitter right there at that synapse, some of the receptors would be biased in the bound state and might result in a higher level of activation because of the spillover. And we're currently uh, studying and quantifying 
amplifying this effect. Go ahead. Yes, it would be. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of there's a lot of disagreement about it. There, there's a lot of disagreement about it in the literature, and it's an open question. And we've Did done simulation. What's that? Simulation oh, the yeah, the yeah. Well, if you consider, well, the, some the, some of the ranges of glutamate levels in the extracellular space vary from, you know, uh, ten, you know nanomolars, tens of nanomolars, um, up to up to you know micromolars or several several micromolars, and and I have a problem with the higher estimates because the the KD of the NMDA receptor is about one micromolar. So if if the some of the estimates are like five micromolar or ten micromolar background level of glutamate in the ex, you know they're kind of constantly there, and if that were the case, the NMDA receptors would be. Um, you know, bound a, a lot, and they go into a desensitized state. So a lot of them would be desensitized. They would open, if, if they were transient, they would open transiently, but then they would, after they close, they would immediately go into this desensitized state and then be then unavailable uh, um, for any further activation for long periods of time. And I suppose, you know, it could happen. Maybe it's a, maybe it could, you, you might consider it to be an effect of, it might happen during epileptic seizures or during ischemia or something where there might be a lot of release of excess glutamate. And it might, that kind of effect that I just mentioned might be an important thing that happens during, during a stroke or epilepsy. But to think about it as a normal physiological state, I think, that, I, think I have problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so M cell, M cell has adaptive time stepping, um, and you're allowed to um, um, give different adaptive time stepping um, um, control over different or over different uh, diffusing particles. So if you have some particles that are diffusing very slowly, like the example you were talking about earlier, and some that diffuse fast. You can have fine time stepping on the fast diffusing things and slower adaptive time stepping on the slower diffusing things to make most efficient use of the, of the calculation. And um, the adaptive time stepping that MCEL does um, is done by um, particles looking in their vicinity for possible partners that they might interact with. And, and if there aren't any, the, the M cell can say, I'm going to move that, this particle farther uh, forward in time uh, because I know there's nothing I can interact with in, in this vicinity. And, and so the scheduler will say, I'll schedule the next, I'll, I'll move it this far, um, which puts it this far forward in time and not schedule another reaction event, I mean a, a diffusion event until that much later point in time. And this is safe to do because you've already figured out that there's nothing else that can possibly, that it can interact with, and nothing else can interact with it. And it's done very conservatively. We could be more aggressive with it, but it's done very conservatively. So make sure there's no, no mistakes. OK. How often do you get applause after that meeting? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> a few times. But lot, mostly lots of smiles. All right. So I'm going to now give you kind of a quick overview as, with as much time as I have uh, left to, because I know I'm between you and lunchtime. I'll try to blast through this. How, how we did that, right? Um, and so we had our motivation was, you know, how do synapses work? And what about? You know, what, what about spillover and crosstalk that we were just talking about? And what about what happens in the presynaptic terminal and, and postsynaptic spine head? And so these are, this is a cartoon overview of all the different uh, molecular components, cellular components that we had in the model. Um, AMPA and NRDA receptors, glutamate, um, um, 
uh, diffusing calcium, the, 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 snare, the snare complex, um, voltage-gated calcium channels in, in the presynaptic terminal and on the, on the postsynaptic spine head, um, NCX and PMCA pumps that are responsible for calcium homeostasis and re restoration of calcium homeostasis after a transient event, glutamate transporters to reabsorb the glutamate, um, circuit pumps on endoplasmic reticulum. Here I left the endoplasmic reticulum out of the axon. And, and various uh, calcium binding proteins, immobile and mobile ones, that um, um, uh, interact with calcium uh, in the cytoplasm as it's um, diffusing around. And so um, you know, I showed you the model that consists of all these uh, components, in addition to the ones I, I was just talking about, we also have calmodulin and CAM kinase 2. And um, in this particular model, there was some calcineurin also present. And we have uh, mitochondrial calcium pumps. And the bulgicated calcium channels on the presynaptic terminal are the PQ type. And the ones on the postsynaptic side are the L and R type. And our constraints consisted of this 3D reconstruction of the hippocampal neural pill. And what's hard to see in this particular diagram is the fact that, that um, 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 a human being has hand traced the outlines of, of all the cellular components there. So Kristen Harris herself personally and her, and her uh, longtime colleague, Joseph Spacek, in, in, who's in Czechoslovakia. Kristen is um, at UT Austin. Personally, did most of the tracing in this with uh, assistance from a few um, top um, physiologists in Kristen's lab, because she wanted this to be a ground truth 3D reconstruction, w which could be compared to any of the automated uh, routines that are being developed. And, um, and then we had the advantage of being able to use that and turn it into a computational model uh, with great painstaking effort uh, to turn this from, uh, from just um, uh, a model that you could do some, um, some simple morphometric analysis or visualization of to turn it into something that was actually computational quality fit for doing numerical simulations in. And it's a big, um, uh, a big step to, to make a mesh that is good enough for that. Um, some, some of the mesh improvement that needed to be done. Oh, OK, so here's a diagram that shows in a little bit more detail um, uh, a particular object that was traced, and then the mitochondria here in red, and endoplasmic reticulum in blue here. Um, after, after turning this into, um, uh, well, so hand segmenting it, you get a bunch of contours, one, one per each. Um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, image in the image stack. So in, in this case, we had images that were, I think, um, 10 by 10 microns and 100 um, and 50 nanometers thick, uh, 50 nanometers thick and 100 of those. So we have five microns in depth. And the images from which this came were 4K by 4K uh, pixels, about 10 microns uh, apart. So the pixels are about four nanometers or so. Um, and from that uh, 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 five by five, or I mean a six by six micron, this, this, this image here is, small, is actually smaller than that. This is about two microns across here. But we had like six by six micron um, um, square region w within which um, everything was traced. Here I'm only showing this one, this one thing here. And the postsynaptic density areas, there's, there's a, f uh, a few here, were, were hand segmented as part of it. So th that was kind of a, a way of getting um, annotation <coughs> of, of, a, of an anatomically distinct uh, region um, directly from the images rather than doing it um, after the fact. Um, in, rather than doing it on the 3D mesh, it was easier to identify those areas in the 2D images. And so you can do annotation at the level of the 2D image, and that gets, tr that gets carried through and transferred onto the mesh by the, by the meshing algorithm that we used. Then 
Um, so you have these contours, and you have a stack of these contours, and they have to, you then have to put a skin on them, what, what we call a contour tiling process. Our colleague, uh, Chandra Bajaj at UT Austin, who's a world expert in computational geometry, he runs the uh, Center for um, Computational Visualization at UT Austin. Um, 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 we used his, contour, his, his algorithm called Contour Tiler, which has now been incorporated into a new comprehensive tool called uh, Vol Rover N. The N stands for, ne for neurons, um, which is available at, uh, at his website at UT Austin. Um, to produce the, the uh, mesh, but, the, um, be but because the Z resolution was only 50 nanometers, um, there, are, there are some problems. So if we, if we take the, the 3D reconstruction of this and look at it and slice it, uh, so if this is the XY plane here, if we slice it in, say, the YZ plane, kind of straight down through, and then magnify this area here, there's a problem. Because of the Z resolution is 50 nanometers, there are areas where the extracellular space has been occluded, or, or is very thin, or has been completely occluded, and there's actually intersections between adjacent objects. And this isn't a problem that occurred during the tracing in, in the XY plane. This is a problem that occurs because of sampling error, aliasing, in the Z direction, because the sampling is only at 50 nanometer in intervals. Um, when, when you put a mesh on, on these things, the position of that mesh is, is, um, uh, uh, is um, um, in, in error because of sampling error. Is this what you mean by adding a skin to it? So the skin kind of is coming around the edges? And yeah, 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 yeah. So I, what, what I'm not showing here are the individual contours that this data came from, they would have been, I'm not sure how, there wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been very many um, con contours in, in the Z direction from which to put the skin on this object, right? And because there's uncertainty about where, where that surface is in space, because you've only sampled it every 50 nanometers, there's a chance that one object here and another object here, when you put that when you put the mesh on it, when I say skin, I mean you tile it with triangles, that, and the triangles span between adjacent contours, there's, there's a chance that the triangles are going to intersect with an adjacent object. And so what has to happen is you need to expand the extracellular space from, from this to, to this. And we have a paper that appeared in a journal of computational I'm sorry, a journal of comparative neurology in uh, 2013 that covers exactly how, how we did all this and what we were able to deduce about the extracellular space after doing this. But interestingly, um, even if there weren't this uh, sampling error, there, um, there, even in the, even in the, um, even in the XY direction, there, the, the, the extracellular space is too, is too narrow. And if, we, and if we take the raw result from the reconstruction and calculate what the extracellular volume fraction is in the reconstruction, it's only about 8%. And in vivo, it's known to be in the 20% range. So uh, even, even, um, even ignoring the, the, the sampling error, there is a big uh, distortion that's occurred in the extracellular space, uh, probably be because of the uh, fixation process. And this is a, a well-known and, and hotly debated uh, topic. But um, in, in the Journal of Comp uh, Comparative Neurology paper, we studied um, how to make these, um, this adjustment and correction to get back to a state that we think is closer to the in vivo state. Um, yeah. So, so, Tom, in your current simulations, you showed us before the extracellular space volume is 20 percent. Yeah. So, how about a uh, recent paper from Mike and Midegard's lab, who shows that during awake state, the extracellular space volume is actually decreasing to about 14 percent. 
Oh, I. So maybe I, we should be now, you know, oh, going, going back. It again and yeah. Going back and that. So just just one second. So, oh, go ahead, go ahead. But these this mountains was probably uh, necessized uh, for confusion. No, they did. Oh, for for this is for hotly debated. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I haven't seen the paper yet, so, but that would be, you know, that would be something important. Um, but uh, so what, what Marcus said earlier about um, after reconstruction, you, you only have one instance. That's true, but in the case here, we, we, we have a little bit of a twist on that because the algorithm that we use to make this correction um, is, you, is, a, is doing a finite element an analysis with, with a certain cost function. Um, and we can, we can adjust the terms in the cost function and get different amounts of ex extracellular space uh, from close to 0% up, um, you know, up to any, any amount, practically, um, um, by, by, moving the, these are, um, by, by moving the membranes uh, around. And so we can actually then generate different, different instances of this correction at different levels. Uh, and then do simulations in, in the different uh, instances and see what effect that has. And, and so now here, here are the kinetic diagrams of the different molecular species I, I was telling you about, AMPA, NMDA, um, uh, LR, and PQ-type voltage.